Hi again. I've heard it said that there was an ancient Chinese curse that said, may you live in interesting times. Well, here we are, living in interesting times. I recently was asked to be part of a discussion concerning the war in Ukraine. I lived 18 months in eastern Ukraine and also a year in Moscow, so the current crisis is something that's close to my heart. Also, because I've done a series of videos on the prophecies of Daniel, I was asked how or if this current war is spoken of in Bible prophecy, or if there are implications for Bible prophecies related to the war. I was asked the question, do you see any evidence in the book of Daniel or Bible prophecy that some of the prophecies there are being fulfilled? Is there any linkage to the war in Ukraine? Interesting question. Um, if the question is, can I put my finger on a verse in Daniel 11 or Zechariah and say, this is it, uh, I can't. I don't see anything specific where this is a direct fulfillment of a Bible verse like that. On the other hand, of course, all these things, they play into a bigger picture. And I definitely feel like, like what you're saying, because this is such a major event and hasn't happened in a long time. And the, and the stability, the world order stability, this is one of the things that can play out because what people say, when war happens, you cannot tell how it escalates. And this is in some of the great battles and great wars, they've escalated much further than anybody expected. So this is the danger that, that this all entails militarily, politically, uh, economically. It's, it's the economic effects of all these things have knock-on effects that uh, are really kind of shaking things big, in bigger ways than the military. I was asked about the economic effects of sanctions against Russia by the West and the steps Russia has taken to retaliate against those sanctions. This is the very interesting thing because it's been so long since there's been anything approaching this kind of war. Like Yugoslavia, I mean, that was bad, but that's that stayed very kind of local right there for those people and all. But this where you have... They can't as easily have wars like they used to because like there's nuclear weapons, there's chemical weapons, there's tactical nuclear weapons. And the concern is, I mean, they have, you know, suitcase atomic bombs. They have localized atomic bombs. And everybody is, mostly everybody is hoping that that will not escalate because that would just open a Pandora's box into a world that we've never been in before. So right now there's all this... Um, economic and financial warfare in many different ways and it's it's the way is the world is so globalized now compared to you know 40 50 60 70 or 80 years ago that you can have that warfare economically but then what putin is sort of counting on is that the west uh is too decadent and too lazy and too comfortable to really tighten their belts the russians are, see themselves as a as a and they are a, a pretty tough people able to, uh, to sacrifice, able to suffer, and then they can take it. Whereas they don't think that the West can really do that. And so this is what's coming up in Germ with Germany. Germany is right at the point of, of gas rationing, and they're doing everything they can to cut down their dependence. So it's a, we're in uncharted territory, you can say it like that. I was then asked how or if this could all develop into a situation that could see the appearance of what the Bible calls the Antichrist, a figure seen in biblical prophecy as being a last and worst world dictator who will lead the world briefly before the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. It's been my theory or whatever you want to call it for years that for the end time antichrist to appear that there has to be a time of some kind of destabilization because everything is so sort of comfortable now and everything is sort of organized. Two of the greatest uh, forerunners of the Antichrist in, in recent memory has been Adolf Hitler and Napoleon Bonaparte. Both of those guys came to power after years of instability, serious instability. And these guys rose up as, as autocratic leaders to pull you know, the cookies out of the fire and to pull things together. And they were successful and the world followed them um, because they were, at least many of the world, followed those. So I feel like I've always I've felt for a long time that something has to happen, either a war or a economic crash. And of course, this situation has a magnitude to it, uh, both in a war level and an economic level, that if it deteriorates, if it escalates, 
that's wh and that's what everybody's the the big guys they're trying to prevent that from happening because if you have a, a deterioration and, and there, it is a fragility they all everybody knows there's a fragility in the economic system there's a fragility in all these things and this is like really shaking stuff so it could be a forerunner of bringing in times that would make it more possible for a an end time leader like that to arise the interviewer mentioned that i've lived both in russia and ukraine and I was asked about my experiences there and why Putin made this attack. So I lived in uh, Dnepr Petrovsk, which is now called Dnepro because it's so difficult to pronounce that, that name and all. I lived there for about 18 months between 2008 and 2009. It was a wonderful time for me, a very, uh, just a wonderful time like that. I worked for very nice people there. And I got to know a part of the world that I'd never been in before. I'd lived in Moscow for a year about 10 years before that, so that was another experience. I guess before I lived in, in Eastern Europe, and I thought, well, if I've lived in Eastern Europe, I, I can go to Moscow, it's, it's, you know. But it was like, no, uh-uh. Moscow was like very different from Hungary or Romania or Czechoslovakia, it's really different. Their history is very, very different. Hungary, Romania, those countries, they are, they've had a middle class. They have been independent. Russia, okay, I'll use this as, as an example. I was out nearly every day doing business in Moscow, and Moscow has a ring road. Of, uh, it's about a nine million people, and there's a ring road that goes all the way around the city, you know, very big city like this. So for the first seven months that I was in Moscow, out almost every day, I did not see a house inside that ring road. There were 25-story apartments, there were office blocks, uh, and that was it. And I was like, and I go, wait a minute, Middle class people have houses. They never had a middle class there. They went from the serfs and the czar to communism to now. So they never built houses. And that was like, that's kind of funny. You know, that, that just sort of, they have, in, their, in the history of Russia, they're like missing things that people in the West, I'm not just talking about America, but, but Europeans, the, the, the Reformation, the, the, all those different experiences, Russians haven't had that. I love Russians, you know, anybody out there, I love Russia, I, I, I should speak it, but I don't. And I have many wonderful Russian friends, but there's certain, certain things that maybe make it possible so that Mr. Putin sees Ukraine as, as theirs. And it was, much of the time, it was called Little Russia. That's what they called it, Little Russia. And I need to add something here regarding what I said about Moscow and houses there. I was there in 1995 and 1996, 12 years before I lived in Ukraine. While it's true that I didn't see houses inside the Moscow Ring Road, I don't mean to say there were no houses in Moscow. I did see houses in the small towns outside Moscow. But the overall feeling at that time was still very much one of the lingering effects of 70 years of Marxist, Leninist, proletarian uniformity. Okay, so here's the deal with Ukraine. It's 40, 44 million people or something like that. It's a very big land mass. It's, uh, it's almost indefensible because it's so flat. It's a little bit like Poland. There's two ethnic groups in, in Ukraine. In the west of the country, there are ethnic Ukrainians. It's a different language. It's similar to Polish. If I'm not mistaken, those people used to be called Ruthenians. If you go back, you know, they were the Ruthenians. That's a language group. But then from Kiev, which is more or less in the middle of the country, from Kiev East, those people speak Russian. They are ethnic Russians. But then the thing is, uh, you know, this is the part of the country I lived in. You know, don't you want to be part of Russia? No way. I'm not. So they are ethnic Russians, but they, uh, uh, they consider themselves Ukrainians. I was asked if there is a Nazi element in Ukraine and if it's true that this is what Putin wants to get rid of. So that's, that's, it has many different levels to it. Um, and before I went there and read up on the whole situation, I really didn't know, I didn't know their history. So well, here's one factor that's a major factor in the whole thing. If you go back in Ukrainian history, um, you know, communism took over Russia and, and so you had the Soviet Union and they started implementing extremely radical uh, economic experiments which in the 1920s, which failed horribly. So they didn't even have any harvests. So what happened was that the communists, I don't say Russians, but the communists came into the Ukraine in the early 1930s 
and just seized all the grain, all the food that they could. Not only the food, but they got the seed corn. And this is the important thing because you're not going to have a harvest if you don't plant the seeds and if you don't have the seeds. So they took everything. So what followed was, it's hard for me to pronounce this word, holodomor, which you can look it up in Wikipedia or something like that. But it was a famine that lasted, I think, two or three years. One to three million people died of starvation in Ukraine. They had cannibalism and they just had a horrific, horrific time in the early 1930s. So the Ukrainians looked not just only to the Russians, but to the communists to have done that. And that's correct. So then you have the World War II starting and you have the Nazis. So it is historically true that when the Nazis tried to come into the Ukraine, that the Nazis were welcomed in the most part uh, because the Ukrainians saw them as people that would defeat the communists. So it wasn't like, oh, we love Nazism. It's like we want these communist Russians driven out. So they were initially welcomed. But then as it turned out, you know, you're, you're changing one devil for the other devil and all. You know, living there, okay, there's a whole thing between Nazism and nationalism. You can be a nationalist, it doesn't mean you're a Nazi. But the left, quite often they like, if anybody is a nationalist and is not kind of pro-left, they love to put this Nazi label on them. And that goes across all of Europe. I mean, you hear that in Sweden and places like that. So, you know, if you're a nationalist and you're not on board with the leftist agenda, you must be a Nazi. It's a complicated kind of thing. I didn't see or experience Nazism. None of my friends ever talk about that. I don't think Nazism is a factor in... There's exceptions, but for the most part, it's, it's not a factor in, in, the, in all this. And I thought to add a bit more here about this subject, since the whole question of Nazism has been given a lot of space in the mainstream media so that many wonder if, in fact, Putin has some justification for his invasion of Ukraine to fight the Nazis, as he said. So I contacted a number of dear friends who are still in Ukraine or have just left in the last month or so. And I asked them about this question as they are either Ukrainians or they're missionaries who spent around 20 years in Ukraine and Russia. Here's what one friend wrote back on this subject. Mark, to answer your question, it's like you said, there's a very low percentage of Ukrainians who one would call neo-Nazis. The number is fewer than 2% because that is the threshold that any given party needs to reach to be able to be represented in the Ukrainian parliament, known as the Rada. The right sector, as that political party is known, has never reached that level. There is a military wing known as the Azov Battalion, which numbers somewhere between 900 to 1,500 men and has Nazi sympathies and are fighting in Mariupol. When you consider the overall size of the Ukrainian armed forces, this is a very small and insignificant number. Putin's special military operation to rid Ukraine of Nazis is an extreme use of propaganda, which amazingly enough finds many non-informed people believing. How can a country which elected a Jew as its president be infiltrated and run by Nazis? Not only is the current president a Jew, but his predecessor, Poroshenko, was also a Jew, as well as many important people in the government. There are no neo-Nazis in important positions in the government or military. This idea of Ukraine being run by Nazis is a complete fabrication of Putin's to justify his invasion of Ukraine. He's playing on the emotions of the Russian people to convince them that he's saving them from Nazism, which of course is a strong motive for Russians who suffered terribly in the German onslaught of World War II. Labeling someone a Nazi in Russia is what arouses fear and hatred and allows Putin to commit the horrendous crimes he is committing in Ukraine to save Mother Russia. What to me is baffling is that there are people in the West that somehow fall for this deception. Putin is a master of deception, and anyone who falls for his lies should realize that they are being duped. I hope that answers your question. End of note from my friend. I was asked how the war in Ukraine will end. What are some possible options as the future unfolds? As far as what would, you know, what are scenarios of where this is all can, can go? There's two or three that I know of that are floating around. At this present moment, the Russians were, have been pulling back, seemingly, from Kiev, where, where they're, as they're concentrating on the east. 
But what some people say is this, that this is what happened with Chechnya. When the Russians first attacked Chechnya, which is like more even of a, of a Russian, you know, it's, it's really more of a, inside of a, it's very much smaller place also. They initially, the Russians got beaten by the Chechens. And so the Russians pulled back, but then they just ground down the Chechens, bombings, uh, starvation, on and on. And they eventually conquered Chechnya. Grozny is the capital. If I'm not mistaken, Grozny in Russian means terrible. So it's a, it's a history of a, of a country that's had really a lot of stuff happen. If the Russians want to just continue to grind down Ukraine and just keep it really, really rough, it could drag out a long time, it could get rougher, and they could end up kind of winning just by a, a war of attrition on them. Second option, which, which is maybe what some people are hoping is, and this is what we talked about earlier, uh, if you use the example of what happened with Austria. In the Second World War, Austria was totally in alliance with Germany. So after World War II, the same way Germany was divided up into four parts, Austria was divided up into four parts. Berlin was four parts, uh, Vienna was four parts. But what happened was in 1955, the Austrian nation worked out an agreement where they said and declared, we're going to be a neutral nation, we're not going to have any foreign troops, we're gonna be non-aligned, we're gonna be a neutral nation. And with that, the Russians pulled out in 1955. And since that time, Austria has been a neutral nation. So Zelensky currently, he's already said, okay, look, we're, we won't be in NATO. Because that was sort of before. That was a, maybe you're going to be in NATO. But the other side of the deal is these people don't want to be uh, in, a, in a, you know, they're not looking east. They are looking west. I can tell you that. It doesn't mean they embrace America and they want to go to Los Angeles or something like that, but they just want to be a free, independent state and have their lives and be westward leaning. And if they did that in a neutral way, maybe that's a solution. That, that may end up being the best possible solution. And finally in the discussion, I brought up how that up until this current war, there were those in places like Hungary and Poland who were positive in some ways about Putin. Up until this time, we, we talked about this earlier, up until this time, some of us were looking somewhat benignly at Mr. Putin because Mr. Putin was speaking positively to people like Viktor Orban in, in uh, Hungary and to the Poles because these guys do not want this edicts from Brussels, specifically about gender issues and things like that, and that Brussels and the EU have pretty much demanded that Hungary and Poland fall in line with West European values. And the Hungarians and the Poles said, no, we're not gonna do that. We're sovereign nations, we're Christian nations, and we're not gonna go along with this. Now, Ukraine borders both Hungary and Poland. So if Ukraine ended up getting its independence, but it doesn't mean that it totally falls in line with West European values as they are right now, then you have some kind of Central European bloc of Ukraine, Hungary, and Poland who are strongly Christian nations. So there's many different scenarios and different possibilities, including which you just have a, a series of cards and dominoes just falling, falling. And as the thing dominoes, then you get into a complete crazy time that we've never been in before. That's yeah. another scenario. I hope that these clips from the discussion and the commentary I've added have been some blessing to you. There's so much falsification that's out there about this war and the reasons for it, that perhaps it helps to hear from people who are directly in contact with those on the front lines who don't have a political agenda to push. There's so much more that could be said. But perhaps just what has been shared here of the facts as I experienced them there, along with what my friends there are letting me know about, will have helped to establish a bit more of the essential facts and background to it all. And I'm glad for this different approach to producing videos where the format is easier and the end results can be finished faster. As ever, I do love you guys and I'm thankful for another opportunity to reach you via video. All the best to you. In Jesus' name.